Hello. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this material today. Uh, my only wish is that I could have been in Beirut to um, present it, um, but sadly that was not to be. I visited Beirut in the past, it's one of my favorite cities. So today I'm giving a, a presentation called Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, um, and it's a brief overview. Um, of AI. We all use the term AI. Many of us have even been using um, platforms, AI-generated pa platforms like Midjourney, but not so many people really understand what it is. And I want to give a brief overview as, uh, about AI today and to kind of talk about the implications of what it has to offer architecture as a discipline and a profession. This year, is I would say the year in which architects have, fun, uh, have finally woken up to the possibilities of AI. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, there have been a number of, of diffusion platforms, Midjourney, Dali2, Stable Diffusion and so on, that have, that have been launched this year and which architects are using to produce some of the most astonishing um, designs. Secondly, there have been a whole series of books that were published this year, uh, including two of my own, um, Machine Hallucinations on the bottom right and Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, an introduction to AI for architects on the top left. So I'm going to be referring in particular to uh, the book on the top left, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, to try and draw out the implications of what AI has for architecture today. <clears throat> so the three questions I'm going to ask um, are what is AI, um, how did it evolve, and how do we use AI to generate our images? So what is AI? Maybe a good starting point would be this definition offered by Margaret Bowden. AI seeks to make computers do the sort of things that minds can do. Is this still correct? First of all, I would say that um, uh, this, was, this was made a few years ago, and I would say that now we realize that AI in certain domains is quite capable of exceeding what human minds can do, and in others, um, not, so, not so much. Um, secondly, I'd say that really, we need to be, be aware of the fact that AI maybe isn't trying to do quite the things that minds can do because it's not concerned on the whole with consciousness. The biggest difference between AI and between artificial intelligence and human intelligence um, is the fact that AI is not conscious. It's not sentient. It's not aware of what it's doing. It has no more capacity to think than a pocket calculator has, has. And yet we use the same terms, neural neural networks, for both the brain itself on the left on the left hand side and the neural networks of deep learning. But they're not quite the same. And when we use the term intelligence, we have to ask whether whether, whether AI really does have the same intelligence. If you can't think, how can you be intelligent? And if you can't think, how can you learn? The standard perception of AI is that it somehow refers to robots. This is perhaps um, a result of, as a result of movies such as Ex Machina, where we see obviously a human actress here playing the role of a robot. And for some strange reason, uh, many people uh, like to see robots looking like human, humanoids, like humans. Sophia, the, 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 the humanoid robot produced by Hanson uh, Robotics of, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, is the opposite. This is a, a, a robot trying to pretend that it's human, but it's absolutely not human. In fact, within the industry itself, there's a huge, there is huge skepticism of Sophia. Rodney Brooks, the famous roboticist, refers to Sophia as completely bogus and a total sham. And Bennett Evans goes on to say that Sophia is little more than a tape recorder with a rubber head on it, maybe is a bit of an exaggeration. And Yann Lacun, the very famous deep learning expert, refers to Sophia as complete bullshit. Within the world of art, there is now we now have a, a, a humanoid artist, Ida, um, which equally I would be highly suspicious of. And this is a paper I gave earlier this summer, Ada, robot artist or con artist. I firmly believe that Ada is complete con. In, uh, recently, uh, Ada was, uh, um, was uh, brought to Egypt um, for an exhibition um, by the pyramids and was seized by the authorities on suspicion of being a spy. 
I, I personally would prefer that they'd seized her either on suspicion of not being an artist in the first place, because when it comes to it, we find out that actually what's happening with, with Ada is that there's a human operator that's actually building upon the first initial scratches that are made, little marks made by, by the robot, and then turning into a painting. Ada did not paint them per se. She made preparatory sketches that were then fleshed out by being fed back into her own algorithm. And then a human art technician, Susie Emery, whose name you do not have to, you, 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 you do have to hunt down to find, did the painting. It wasn't as though it was simply produced by AI. Gotcha. In fact, if you want to understand what AI is, don't think humanoid robot, think algorithms. Essentially, AI is simply software, very sophisticated software, but software nonetheless. It's therefore, it's therefore, it's completely invisible. If you want to think about the office of the future, we're not going to be surrounded by humanoid robots like this, but we are going to be surrounded by AI. In fact, we already are, even though we don't realize that. On our phones, for example, we've got many AI-powered uh, apps. We, AI is what, is what filters out our spam on, 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 uh, on the internet. AI is what finishes our sentences when we're using Gmail. AI is what, what gives us the shortest route when we're using Waze. It's what allows us to go to, to book an Uber taxi. Uh, it's what tells us when we're straying out of lane when we're driving. It's in the house. It's what it's what controls the less thermostat. It controls our robotic uh, um, uh, hoovers, and it's what it controls Alexa and Siri. We are everywhere surrounded by AI, but we may not be aware of it. Aware of it, because AI is invisible. In my book, I make this comment: It is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, superintelligent alien species. So how did AI evolve? The first person to conceptualize the possibility of AI was Alan Turing, one of the, 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 the originators of, of, of the computer in the first place. In, in 1950, Alan Turing uh, published a paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which makes that connection, although the term artificial intelligence had yet to be coined. In fact, the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956 uh, for a meeting of, of uh, a number of researchers and scholars at Dartmouth, uh, Dartmouth College in the States. Their ambition was to bring together all the great minds in the field uh, with a view to solving all the problems of AI with, within the space of about two years. John McCarthy, who, uh, who, who coined the term, and he's seen on the bottom right here, um, John McCarthy, who coined the term, uh, had, had come across it before. He couldn't quite find out where, but he, and he was never quite happy with the term. And for sure, I don't think artificial intelligence is, is a very good term. Synthetic intelligence would be better. And we might even need to change the term intelligence because it seems it's not the same as human intelligence. Interestingly, 50 years later, the same group got back together. Um, and you can see Marvin Minsky here um, uh, at, for a, a reunion of the survivors. And actually, by 2006, AI had really achieved very little. It had been, it had been, there had been a lot of hype about what it would achieve but actually it hadn't achieved so much. But coincidentally, 2006 was around the time that deep learning took off. And that's really what revolutionized AI and what means that it's so powerful these days. The problem is though, we use the same term AI to refer to what was being promoted in the early days and what is being used right now. It's like, like if you can make a comparison with the the first ever car, which is still called the car, and the Tesla self-driving car of today. Both use the same car, but they're fundamentally different. And likewise, in the domain of AI, there is a huge difference between the very early use of AI and what we're using right now. In fact, what we're using right now is most, most probably deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which itself is a subset of artificial intelligence. Think of them as being a bit like Russian dolls uh, nested inside each other. But when we use the term artificial intelligence, but in, in most of the time, we're going to be referring to deep learning because that is what has been proved so effective. And the reason why deep learning has, has, been, has proved so effective has been a number of developments. Neural networks were actually explored in the very early days of AI, but it's now that they, their real potential has been realized 
thanks to a number of factors. Far greater computer computing power and better algorithms, the first one, the introduction to, to cloud surfaces, the services that allows that allow us to uh, access the GPUs remotely. Uh, the sheer uh, competition and capital investment going on in, in AI has also been a factor. The number of college students doing uh, working on AI, and that includes, of course, the number of architectural students also working on AI. And finally, the amount of data that has been generated recently, because deep learning depends on data. Data is, it were, as it were, the new oil. There's been more data generated in the last two years than of our previous history. If we're going to look to two events that maybe um, articulate this shift um, towards deep learning, we could perhaps look at uh, the two high profile media events. Um, firstly, a game of, of chess between IBM's Deep Blue and Gary Kasparov, the then world champion, that took place in 1997. And secondly, a game of Go. The game of, of, of chess was something that, that nobody expected Gary Kasparov to lose. After all, Gary Kasparov was, was, has been, is one of the greatest chess players of all time. But lose is what he did. Uh, and this was actually predicted by Ray Kurzweil to happen before to the year 2000. And it happened in 1997. But as a consequence of losing, Gary Kasparov makes this important point. We just have to understand that everything that we know how to do machines will eventually do better than us. Anything you can do, AI can do better. But perhaps the most spectacular match to take place was the one of Go between, um, uh, between uh, AlphaGo, developed by DeepMind in London, and uh, Lee Sedol, uh, one of the greatest ever Go players of all time. Now, the difference between chess and Go is enormous. Uh, Go is infinitely more complicated. There are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And therefore, they had to develop a different system. Deep Blue had been trained as it was an expert system. It had been trained on all the known games of, of, of chess. But, but AlphaGo was a learning system that was able to, to, to uh, far exceed the capabilities of what Deep Blue could do. Again, nobody thought that Lisa Dole was going to lose this match, but everyone was surprised, Lisa Dole most of all. And game two, in many ways, was the turning point. Yesterday, Lisa Dole comments, I was surprised, but today I am speechless. And the particular move that he's referring to was the, what something has now become famous within the world of Go and within, within the world of AI, and that is move 37 in game two. It's this particular black stone here, which rather unusually has been placed on the fifth line and not the fourth line or the third line as most, as most uh, initial um, plays in the game of Go um, uh, are located. But what happened with this, as with other so-called slack moves that were played in this game, is that AlphaGo was operating at a level that no human could understand. And it wasn't until later that the sheer brilliance of this strategic move became obvious. And 100 moves later, in fact, that this, this stone here connected with these two stones here as though it had been predicted and AlphaGo won this match. But the fact that no human was able to recognize this is highly significant. AlphaGo was operating at a level that no human could comprehend. In fact, some of the commentators that day thought that it was a mistake. Uh, from the Google uh, team was talking about uh, is this kind of, of evaluation uh, value? Uh... That's a very that's Ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was a mistake, but it was no mistake. Um, Alpha uh, later on, Lisa Dahl was to come up with a comment. AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. And this game had a huge impact on the world itself. Uh, Kai-Fu Lee writes about it in his book, AI Superpowers, comparing China to Silicon Valley. And he makes the comment, this was the Sputnik moment for China. China is a go-playing nation. And there were millions watching this particular match. And when AI won and when, won, when AlphaGo won and won so spectacularly, this was kind of a wake-up call, a wake-up call to the potential of what AI could be. Kai Fuli refers to this as a Sputnik moment. 
The original Sputnik moment was in 1957, when the Soviet Union sent a satellite into space for the first time. And the Americans realized that they were behind in the space race. This led to the formation of NASA, and the rest, of course, is history. But it was a wake-up call for all the Go-playing nations in the world. But if AlphaGo was spectacular, the next generation, AlphaGo Zero, was even more spectacular. AlphaGo Zero played 100 matches against AlphaGo and beat it 100 games to zero. What's more, uh, it was able to teach itself Go without knowing the games, the, the rules of the game of Go using reinforcement learning. Now, if that's not spectacular enough, it's the speed at which it taught itself that, that is so remarkable. AlphaGo Zero played 4.9 million games of Go against itself in three days. Now that sounds a lot, but when you think about it, that represents 20 games of Go per second. Now this hummingbird, which admittedly has been slowed, slowed down, is beating its wings at approximately three beats per second in this video. Imagine something seven times as fast. It's simply incomprehensible how, how powerful AI can be. And most people don't realize that. They somehow think that nothing could be, could be, could be superior to human beings, Jack Ma being one example. I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another, another thing that is smarter than human beings. Elon Musk disagrees. I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think it's, it's like a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. And we won't even be able to understand it. It will be able to operate at a level beyond that which we can operate. And one can think about this maybe by comparison with, let's say, a dog that's able to smell or hear things well beyond the threshold that humans can smell or hear things. So how exactly does AI generate images? I want to just take you through um, the shift that's been happening um, between what are referred to as GANs, generative adversarial networks, and diffusion platforms that have just been released this year and which are transforming the world of design. But let me start at the beginning. Makotose Watanabe is a, a famous com computer architect, computational architect from Japan, and he makes the kind of, kind of comment that probably was, was, was um, quite, quite common, uh, held by many people at the time. Machines are better than people at solving complex problems with many intertwined conditions. In that realm, people are no match for machines, but people are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. Is that still the case? The, one of the breakthroughs in terms of deep learning, and here we can see a deep learning neural network with, with certain hidden layers here, is how it was able to um, recognize an image of, uh, in this case, a bird, and, and much quicker than any other system. In 2012, the, the, uh, a deep learning system won the Internet ch Challenge, and people woke up to the fact that actually deep learning could be, hu be hugely effective. What happens here is basically these are neurons and these are synapses joining the neurons and the flow, information, the flow of information goes from left to right, governed by the weights on each of the synapses that control the flow of information. These can be um, adjusted over time, um, but through a process called back propagation. And eventually uh, it will recognize that this is a bird. It will never, it'll never be 100% sure. It will always be 99% sure at best but it'll be able to recognize the bird. And that was a huge breakthrough at the time. But a few years later, they began to realize that actually this process could operate in the opposite direction. In other words, you could start with the concept of the word bird and generate an image of a bird, which of course had been the holy grail of computer science for many years. So what this says, suggests in some ways is that the process of generation of creation of image is somehow the opposite of the process of interpretation. And one can see how maybe uh, architects often are either designers or they're theorists, but seldom both, because it would seem that this process uh, operates in a different direction. 
The first attempts to do this produced what became known as Deep Dream, a somewhat trippy set of images um, that were, were, were had been uh, using a neural network trained on a certain set of data. In this case, it would appear to be dogs and serpents or snakes and maybe an oil lamp or something, and it reads these into everything that it sees. But because certain information has been lost, the, the, the picture is pose invariant. In other words, the images are not in their correct place, and you get this extraordinary, rather trippy, hallucinate, hallucinatory image. But this, this process was, was much improved by the development of GANs, generative adversarial networks that were invented by Ian Goodfellow. And the way that a GAN works is they're two separate neural networks, as it were, competing against each other, generative adversarial networks. There's a generator in, on here on the left here that is taking random noise and producing images that the discriminator is then judging against the data set. If the discriminator it thinks it's of a high enough standard, it will accept it. If not, it will reject it. And as a result of that, the discriminator effectively trains the generator and improves it. And eventually you can take away the discriminator and the generator will, will operate at a high standard. But equally, well, what is often overlooked is that the generator is also training the discriminator in order to be about the questions of creativity itself. What happened as a result of that is that GANs were able to produce some astonishing images. Um, and, this, and in this case, of people that, who do not exist. So in many ways, it disproved Wako, Makoto Samuel Nathanabe's comment. It disproved him and showed that the AI could produce images of people who do not exist. In fact, there is a website you can go to, this person does not exist, where every time you refresh the browser, you will get a very uh, realistic image of a person. What is happening here is that clearly they're training on a data set of, of faces of Hollywood actors or something, and then it's, it's, been, it's, it's creating each time a completely different image of someone who doesn't exist. It wasn't long, of course, between, before architects began to pick up on this. This is the work of Wanyu Her of X Cool where she is hallucinating buildings. They're only two dimensional images of buildings, they're not three dimensional buildings, but nonetheless, it's using GANs. She's using GANs to generate um, buildings. This building does not exist. And it wasn't long before architects were really using GANs to, in, a, in, a, in a very precise way. This is the work of Refik Anadol. Uh, Refik Anadol is a media artist from Turkey, um, who is not an architect, but he uses um, architect uses buildings as both his, his data and also his canvas, and that he often projects his his um, his images, his videos onto buildings. And in this case, he's taking the data set of, of the work of Zahadid architects and is, uh, is is basically uploading thousands upon thousands of images of that data set into the system and then using it to hallucinate other possible buildings. I think you can see in this particular image that the, there must be a number of images of uh, Zaha's uh, Soho building in Beijing. And this is effectively, I think, the first example, uh, it comes from 2019, the first example of using style GANs to hallucinate a design of a building. Of course, it's very laborious, the whole process, you have to do all this preparation in the first place, and, and what you get out is hardly very perfect, but nonetheless, it is a, a significant step. And this architecture was maybe a year behind the world of art. The world of art had in 2018 had already auctioned off a, an AI-generated um, painting. It had also um, given an AI-generated painting uh, a, a, the international award, and it also heard, held the first exhibition of, uh, of AI-generated paintings. But architecture was in many ways a year behind. And what we can see from this is, is the process working itself out. Zaha might no longer be with us, but AI is able to design a building that Zaha may or, or may not or could have designed herself. At least you can get one glimpse of this. And in a short moment, you'll see coming out of the computer an image that is in many ways quintessentially Zaha. It's not designed by Zaha, but it's drawn upon the data set of, of, of works by Zaha, and it's as though it could have been designed by Zaha herself. And in a second, you will see that image. <clears throat> and here it is. 
And in fact, that was the image that we used on the front cover of this of my book, Architecture and Age of Artificial Intelligence. Um, uh, and, and it's very significant in the history. Following on from that, there are a number of different uh, essays and or attempts to try and produce um, a more sophisticated version of this. This is um, the work of Corp Himmelblau, um, the Deep Himmelblau project, masterminded by Daniel Bolojan, that uses style GANs, cycle GANs, and a number of other techniques to take the data set of previous buildings by the Corp Himmelblau office and to hallucinate other possible things, very much in the way that, uh, that, that Rethik's work had done, but at a level that goes well beyond the initial uh, attempt by Rethik Anadol. This was very much the state of the art in 2021. This project won both a Digital Futures Award and also an Acadia Award. It was very much the best that we had produced by then. But then something different began to happen. So these are the images you can get. They're slightly glitchy, but they are in many ways quite, quite convincing in terms of images of potential buildings. And this was the image, of course, that we used on the front cover of the issue of architectural design that uh, Matthias Del Campo and I uh, co-guest edited um, this year, Machine Hallucinations, Art Architecture and Artificial Intelligence. Alongside this was another uh, enterprise, um, uh, OpenAI, which was a, a company that had initially been supported by, by um, Elon Musk, um, was developing a, a massive pre-trained language model called GPT-3. GPT-3 was, the, was the, the, the third in a generation of these, and it was pre-trained with, with literally millions of, 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 of data, much of data in the past, um, and it was used in a different sort of way. It was used um, it, to generate images um, through, the, through captions. On, on the internet, there are plenty of, of images that are connected with text through captions, and what you can do with this process, which uses um, a kind of a Markov chain network that generates um, Gaussian noise that disrupts an image and therefore allows the AI, uh, prompts the AI to go and repair it, a very, very different process to the generative adversarial network, what you're able to do is to search and synthesize data um, from the internet. So in this particular case, um, uh, 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 there has never been an astronaut uh, who's ridden a horse before, at least we don't have photographs of it, and yet you can take that and put a prompt in that allows this to then produce uh, an image of what a, an astronaut would do had an astronaut been riding a horse. This was really quite shocking to those who first saw it, and there are many other examples. A cat dressed as the French Emperor Napoleon holding a piece of cheese. The text at the top is maybe not so convincing, but the image itself is. Or this one, oil painting of a teenager texting her boyfriend, beautiful lighting, Caravaggio, 1580. Clearly, there were no cell phones in the time of Caravaggio, and yet you can search and synthesize an image as though there were. Then came what uh, Patrick Schumacher has described as a Sputnik moment for architecture, when we were able to use these, uh, these, the, uh, this system to generate DALI 2 to generate images of buildings. In fact, uh, uh, Zaha Hadid architects had access to the system before it had been released to the general public because Rafi Garadol had been given permission to test it out. And he went through a series of, um, of, of experiments, explorations with Zaha Hadid architects where they began to hallucinate buildings that were really very convincing and uh, definitely uh, uh, much better than anything that we could, be, could have generated using GANs. So the office itself is able to generate Zaha buildings, even though Zaha is no longer here. But what's more, we are able to generate Zaha buildings. Even if we don't work for the office, we can use Zaha in the prompt and generate this. This is actually mid-journey, which has become more popular than Dali too with most architects. And you can see how this particular um, hotel room um, can be generated in the style of Zaha Hadid. And you even get these little pictures positioned on the wall. The lighting is fairly effective, as indeed are the reflections on the marble floor. And it's, it's, it is remarkable what you can achieve and generate seemingly Zaha-like images um, very quickly as a result of using this particular kind of system. Um, and then the other, possi other possibilities, maybe more sort of Gary-like, but you can produce um, art galleries and buildings and so on using the journey that they can look extremely convincing and realistic. This is why everybody is shocked by Midjourney and how effective and how powerful it can be as a tool. 
it doesn't have to be kind of a Zaha building, a kind of a, a freeform building. It could be a kind of minimalist, modernist building. This is a, an image that was uh, generated by Midjourney based on a prompt about a, a minimalist uh, villa in the Swiss Alps. And you can see in the background a very convincing profile of the Swiss Alps. And you can see how the reflections operate uh, here in the water. Now, of course, in fact, um, uh, Midjourney doesn't really know what the reflections should be because it has no three-dimensional conception of what we're dealing with. But nonetheless, it can produce a fairly convincing effect of a, of a reflection. This is a, a study about the office of the future um, where, uh, again, remarkable things come out. But what is interesting about this, if you look closely, what you read as chairs, you then realize there, is, there are no legs to these chairs, that actually there are no legs to the table either. But somehow what's interesting is that is the, the eye somehow reads that into it as though it is there. Likewise, this kind of image, we're not quite sure where the end of the, the office is or how this chair is supported, but nonetheless, we read it as though it is supported. This is a series of uh, furniture, uh, 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 sofas that I generated using Midjourney. And what I always try and do is to include something in the prompt that destabilizes the, the initial prompt. Uh, in this case, I used a particular frog. Now, it works a bit like a, a grit in the oyster, in a sense. It kind of, this is what produces the pearl. It sort of moves it into a kind of a radical new dimension. And it's very convincing what you can produce, very convincing in terms of its form and realistic in many ways. But what is also very interesting is that occasionally, if you, if you do introduce a, the, a frog into the prompt that gives you this, this impression, it actually appears in the image itself. This was a, another series of uh, furniture that I did using um, a shark. And I think you can see the texture of the shark, the shark skin itself appearing throughout these images. It is remarkable how realistic and convincing this can be. And especially when it's dealing with materiality and what, bear in mind that AI itself is completely immature. And yet you can produce these pebbles that look absolutely convincing as pebbles. And this is a series I did where I was uh, breeding, as it were, the work of Zaha Hadid, the designs of Zaha Hadid with, uh, with a white orchid. And something comes out that is somewhere in between, that is an extrapolation of both of those. It's a bit like ge genetic engineering or genetic algorithms. You are, as it were, cross-breeding alternative um, to different sources to produce something that is remarkable. And again, with a very convincing sense of materiality. It's though you can almost feel the marble that's been used for this or the surfaces that have been used and so on. And what is interesting for me is that it means that, that, that someone who maybe doesn't have as much technical expertise, someone like myself, is able to produce this um, and able to produce very, very convincing images. So this is going to have a huge impact on the whole domain of architecture itself. This was a project that I did that used the term cocoon that has cocoons everywhere, as it were. But nonetheless, expanding the possibility of what we can imagine, increasing the range, operating, as it were, a bit like a kind of a, um, a, a, a muse, inspiring us. We are prompting that we are writing the prompts, but AI is prompting us. This is a study that I did, uh, again, using Zaha and also with a sunset. And what it, it, it some cast it in a, in, a, in a desert setting to begin with, and out of the sand, the sand dunes and things, something begins to emerge that over time, as you go through the iterations, and there were 25 or so iterations in this, in this project, allows certain buildings to, as it were, emerge from the desert itself in a radically new and fascinating way, producing forms that we hadn't come across before and opening up the possibilities of what architecture might be. We should see it therefore as a kind of prosthesis, a prosthesis to the human imagination that allows us to do much more than we could in the past. And it's not so much a question of humans competing against AI, so much as humans using AI competing against other humans who aren't using AI. That seems to be the way in which we're operating today. This was a, a, a series that was, um, was, was made by breeding uh, Zaha Hadid architects um, with a thundercloud. And it starts off with the kind of Zaha design thundercloud, as it were. And gradually, over time, we can see something emerging out of this kind of 
design the thundercloud that begins to start turning into something we recognize as a building. And this is part of the process of what happens when you work with mid-journey, you can iterate and iterate, and eventually it will come, it'll get more and more refined and more and more building-like as we go. So what are we to make of all this? It seems to me that we're at the threshold of something new, something new that is going to have a huge transformation um, on the world of architecture. What is importantly, it, it allows us to understand what AI can produce. All the books that were written that were published this year were written before these diffusion platforms were introduced and therefore the illustrations were, no, were, were nowhere near as good. But because architects tend to sort of privilege the visual and need to see things, it was only when we started producing designs like this that really architects started to pay attention to this. It was AI has been around for some time, but we need to see visual evidence of it. And of course, it doesn't have to be contemporary progressive architecture. We can also look at uh, traditional arabesque architecture. This is a, a series of studies, this series, this is a series that I produced um, using the term arabesque architecture. And you can see how uh, it begins to sort of open up and suggest something that is quite unusual. None of these buildings have been built. They don't actually exist. And yet somehow it's generating something that is surprisingly convincing. It can be anything. It can be a modernist building, a, a, a freeform building, it can be a traditional building, or indeed it can be a very progressive building. It seems to me that, that, that this last has shaken architects. This technique, these techniques have, have convinced architects of the possibility that AI is going to have a huge impact on the world outside. So we shift from, from the GANs to the, to the diffusion models and the speed at which we can operate and the sophistication at which we can operate is greatly enhanced. I'm left thinking though that really there is much more in the pipeline as it were. Um, there is much more that has been produced because that's the software that's going to be available in three to five years time is already uh, um, in, in, in production as it were. And in three to five years time, the world of architecture will be radically different. Um, what happens right now, if you think about Zaha's office, they will start off with a kind of a, a something, doing a sketch in Maya, they then put it into Rhino, and eventually they put it into BIM, and so on and so on. What's going to happen in three years' time is it going to be one single seamless platform where we will start from data and end up with fabrication, and where everything is going to be incorporated. All the, the regulations, the building codes are going to be incorporated, all the costs are going to be incorporated, all the performance criteria, the acoustic performance, the structural performance, the environmental performance, all this will be incorporated on a single platform. And it's going to be mind blowing what it's going to be, what's going to happen. BIM will be over. And this is the point. This so I want to sort of include this comment here from Alan Turing. This is only a foretaste of what is to come and a shadow of what is going to be. And I think we can take this and say that Mid Journey and Dali of themselves, just a foretaste of what is to come and a shadow of what it's going to be. If there are two models we need to think about in terms of the future of architecture itself, is it possibly the game of AlphaGo and the self-driving car? Interestingly, the, the observations about AlphaGo and Move 37 are borne out in the way that some of the AI software, in this case, SpaceMaker AI, um, has been performing. This might seem a fairly conventional design in, in terms of its, its layout, but the technique used for it, using SpaceMaker AI, was radically different. And what is interesting also is that, that, that Harvard Hochland comments that actually what's happening here is very similar to AlphaGo. Things that we couldn't have conceived of, the, the AI is generating. It's much smarter than we are, and it's, even though you have a room full of very qualified architects, it can produce solutions that are more effective than anyone, any of them would have thought about. But importantly also, it's clear that clients are beginning to say that they want to use, want their architects to use AI. It's very clear that in the future, uh, AI will be part of the office itself. No one will be able to operate without AI. It's what will guarantee for the client the maximum return on the investment. That's why the client wants the architect to use AI. AI will be a game changer in how the office of the future operates. 
But there is, of course, a dark side to this. In 2019, Lisa Doll, who'd been beaten so convincingly by AlphaGo, gave up the game of Go on the, uh, in the, with, the, with the comment, this is an entity that cannot be defeated. And if you look at the example of the self-driving car, there are also lessons to be learned here. In his book about the future of AI, Toby Walsh makes this prediction, we won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will not even notice or care. So what does he mean by this? What he's suggesting is that self-driving cars will come along, we'll find them very convenient and we'll use them more and more. But as a result of that, we will start losing our driving skills. So insurance premiums will go up and of course, self-driving cars will become way more reliable than humans could ever be. Insurance premiums will go up and eventually we'll just give it up completely because it's so expensive to drive and just use a self-driving car and we won't even notice or care. We live in many ways in a culture of amnesia. We forget what's going on. How many of us remember what it was like in the days when we had fax machines, when we didn't have Wi-Fi, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have laptops, but there was a time and it wasn't so long ago. The question then comes then, well, so, so what will happen um, to, to the world of architecture? Is it the same kind of principle that we will, professional indemnity will go up unless we use AI? And will it, we even reach the stage where AI is so capable, it will design better buildings than we will? We won't be like, and will it be the case where we won't be allowed to design buildings anymore and we will not even notice or care? There is, in other words, a dark side to AI. It's not that AI is inherently evil. There's nothing evil about any tool, but rather it is so effective, it's so uh, uh, remarkably effective that it has a, the danger that it will displace architects altogether. So AI is a mixed blessing. It is both amazing, but it's also terrifyingly amazing. But one thing's for sure, we need to wake up the possibility of AI, because if there's anything we need to design right now, it's not buildings, but our future as architects. Let me leave you here with my Instagram address where I, I, I upload all my, uh, my experiments in mid-journey and the Digital Futures Library, where we have a number of, um, of, of recordings of discussions about uh, AI and many other subjects. Thank you.